Got to get the clicker ready. Perhaps because I worked at several schools in my career, or perhaps because I live outside the typical attendance area for Archbishop Mitty, so my neighbors know less about our school, I get asked with some regularity to explain what makes Mitty the special place that it is, why I'm willing to commute over the hill in the wee hours of the morning day after day. And if a computer's handy, I pull up a video of the school community joining together and singing the liturgical theme song for the year. My neighbors know immediately, and you should know, that this joy-filled phenomenon doesn't happen everywhere. The scene captures a campus culture that is, well, wonderful and wonder-filled. Behind me is this year's liturgical theme song, or a portion of it, which in my view serves its important formative function in part due to the fact that it speaks to a profound, to a fundamental truth. This morning, I direct our attention to this line of the song, Come Set Me Free. The sentiment asks that we be released from fear, but fear of what? And how shall we be freed? Today's gospel reading is instructive in this. In our faith tradition, the Bible is divinely inspired writing, and the gospels capture the life and teachings of Jesus at once human and God. But even outside of Christian circles, the Bible is important literature. And like all important literature, all stories of literary merit, to coin the AP exam phrase, the Bible reflects the concerns of its time, of the audience hearing it then. But also it continues to be read because it speaks to the concerns of a contemporary audience as well. That's why in colleges and universities, public and private, you can often take a course entitled The Bible as Literature. So what's the gospel passage about? First of all, this, the disciples are afraid, and as happens so often in life when we're afraid, that fear gets revealed as anger. They're mad at the two sons who seem to have been promised a privileged place with Jesus, a place they supposed that they, the men who faithfully followed Jesus for some time now, who've sacrificed all the joys of their past lives to join him in his mission, they would be favored with a special and unique closeness to whom they have come to see as the Messiah, the Son of God. The disciples are afraid they'll be left out, left behind, that somehow the favor of God has only so much extension, and if others get it, they will not. Now, what does this have to do with us living some 20 centuries past the original setting of the story? In literary analysis parlance, what's the meaning of the work as a whole? The disciples, disciples fear what we all fear on our less than best days, that there just isn't enough of the good things in life for me to be certain that I'll get mine. There isn't enough stuff or enough opportunities or enough time for me to get all that I so desperately want. Because you see, we're the species that can anticipate and therefore fear that we're running out of time. To put a precise point on it, we fear our deaths, the end of this life that we know so well and that we love. And because we are thus reflective on the limited time that we have here, and because we can imagine a life stretching far beyond that, because we have a glimpse of the divine, of a life much longer and richer than this one, we fear missing out on all that we hope for while we're here. Matthew chapter 20 also speaks of the fears of the mother. And to be honest, it is in this capacity that it resonates most fully with me. Editor's note, shameless and unapologetic bragging on my sons is to commence now. You think? <laughs> God bless their mother and thank God they didn't look like me. <laughs> the mother of the two sons in the gospel passage is a parent and she's worried about how her two sons will do in life. And I get that. I've known a depth of joy, excitement, fascination, and yes, fear, more pronounced than I ever felt before my sons showed up. Dylan and Aiden mean everything to me. 
And so it is throughout their lives, despite all their successes along the way, I've worried. I've been afraid, sometimes mildly, sometimes more than that. Will they be smart enough? Socially adept enough? Will they have friends? Meet someone special? Get a good job and grow to honorable adulthood? And is there more that I can do to ensure that they will? I suppose I should worry less. Dylan and Aiden have grown up nicely, growing into those large heads they were born with, and the strapping young men whose high school years I was lucky enough to share with them as their high school principal. Lucky for me, mind you, you'll have to ask them what their impressions are of having your dad ever present on your small Catholic high school campus. Dylan grew to be a deep thinker, a philosophy major at Santa Clara University, and as smart and insightful as anyone you'll meet. So too with Aiden, a writer at heart and a basketball star in high school, he went on to a degree in journalism at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. If you're intrigued or polite, you might ask me or Mr. Brosnan about the unique joy that comes with handing your own son his high school diploma as his principal. There's Dylan in his grad picture from Santa Clara and Aiden with his diploma from Cal Poly. And finally, my joyful bragging ends soon. Here's a more recent shot of my sons now living together in Seattle. Aiden working for Amazon, Dylan working for a smaller tech firm, both with budding careers in computer tech. Who knew they were headed for that? Not me. And even though, <laughs> and even though they're doing so well, and I am, yes, so very proud of them, still I carry a parent's fears. What if they wind up hating their jobs and quit? What if they don't get the promotions they surely deserve? What if they fall in love and then out of love with the heartache that accompanies that? What if they never move back closer to home so that I can't plan to see them often and here's hoping the grandchildren that will someday come along? Parents will tell you, you never stop being a parent and you worry forever about your children you love so fervently. The worry about them just changes form which segues nicely back to our liturgical theme song. I think Jasmine Murray, the author of the song, has it exactly right. The language of the song is precise. It says, I want to be fearless, and the less formal, I want to be fearless. Notice, it doesn't say I am fearless, or even I'm going to be fearless, because you're not, and I'm not either. Not all the time, anyway. Let me explain. It's like this. In our humanity, we can aspire to be perfect in all that we do, knowing full well that we won't ever be perfect. And that knowledge does not diminish the sincerity of that aspiration. It doesn't cheapen it, nor make it somehow hollow. So it is that Haley Jones knows before the season begins that she'll miss some free throws. She won't make every free throw she shoots all season long. But in the big game, at the end, with the game hanging in the balance, she steps to the line and presumes that this one now will go in. So too with Lauren Hanniger and her volleyball serves. They won't all go in, but not this one now. And Shamir Bay knows that not every pass he throws will be right on target. But that doesn't mean he plans to fail on this play. Connor Sherry knows that he'll not be perfect in the delivery of every line on stage. That at some point the timing or phrasing will be just slightly off. But still, waiting in the wings to make his entrance, he intends that this speech, this act, this performance will be flawless. That we aspire to be perfect in what we do is not somehow hypocritical because we know upon reflection that we can't be. On our best days, we may come close. On our less than best days, we may be far from the perfection we hope for ourselves. And the fervent wish for all of us is to increase the number of those best days and to reduce those less than best days. For me, that means I want to be a good husband and a good dad. But more, I want to be what I won't be, a perfect husband and dad. And I also mean to be a perfect teacher and administrator, 
insightful, compelling in classroom oratory, engaging, patient, but with high expectations, and nice. But I'm not always that. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> For those of you whom I've taught, or I've coached, two classes of AP Lit students who are still here at MIDI, Mr. Eagleson, Mr. Walker, Mr. Arias, Mr. Smith, Ms. Cronung, Ms. Zagmeyer, you're fully aware of my limitations as your teacher or coach. And for those of you whose parents I've taught, Ellen and Amy Ferguson, Mia Pesavento, don't you believe those stories they tell you about way back then. And for those of you who worked for me at different schools, Mr. Mahineke, Ms. Smilo, Ms. Medea, Ms. Hoover, Ms. Zagmeyer, and Mr. Watson, and for all my colleagues here now at MIDI, you are all keenly aware that I fall well short of perfection. But I'm working on it. And that's true for all of us, by the way, and it's the basis to the point the liturgical theme song means to bring home. How shall I, how shall we, be freed from fear? Well, fully, all the time, that will only happen when we leave this life and its human limitations into the next life and its divine perfections. But also, along the way, we can better, get better at living less afraid if we can just remind ourselves first of Jesus' promise that we will be with God for all time and that there's nothing hypocritical in the desire to be more tomorrow than I am today and that God's blessings regularly grace me with wonder-filled days, many days and more than I notice unless I really pay attention, that alert me, remind me of how good my life really is. Fearless? I'm not there yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs>